So uh, welcome everybody and uh, happy Friday. It's, uh, it's a delight to have you here. And uh, I'm gonna talk this afternoon about trust and uh, specifically brand trust or consumer trust. Um, now, uh, overall, uh, the, 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 what I'm, the sort of main thing I'm gonna be talking about is the Gustafson Brand Trust Index. We've been measuring brand trust for uh, six years now, since 2015. Um, but I'll talk in, in more general terms about trust to begin with. I'll talk uh, trust in, about trust in society and in institutions and what it means. Um, what is brand trust um, and how we look at brand trust. I'll talk then about how we measure it in our, in our model. Um, and then we'll talk about some of the results we've had over the years and some of the learnings we've had. Um, towards the end of the presentation, then I'll talk about some of the questions that we had coming out of the, um, the, the 2019 survey and going into 2020, and then uh, tell you about some of the stuff we did to pivot once the COVID-19 uh, thing happened. Uh, so, and that then will leave us with some remaining learnings and questions and that, that kind of thing. So to begin with, I'd like to start by just introducing the team at Gustafson who actually work on, uh, on brand trust. So we have our Dean, uh, Saul, uh, Saul Klein, there's me, Linda She is uh, the person who, who runs a, a lot of the statistical modeling behind the, behind the, uh, the index and uh, Venus basically tells us all what to do and she's uh, our, our uh, coordinator and project manager and uh, the person who really keeps an eye on what's going on in the media. Okay, so moving moving on. Um, excuse me. Let's make sure I got this. There we are. So I'm going to uh, start with uh, with the end with some summary uh, summary issues that we've uh, come up with, and these are some of the lessons that we have uh, learned from the research we've done on trust, and they're important. We believe both for businesses and for society at large. One thing is trust is very much the, the, the basis of social behavior. It matters to business and it matters to brands. And we have found in particular that good behavior by, um, uh, by brands and by businesses is rewarded um, and bad behavior is punished. And you can see that in our results. And I'll show you, show you how that happens in a, in a short while. It is hard to gain as we've seen, we've seen over the six years, many uh, brands that have have, have sort of slowly climbed up in the trust rankings, some of that have suddenly dropped and had a real real problem coming back. Um, value for money, i.e., you know, the, what, what brands do, which is what do you, what do you, what do, how do they perform versus what you pay for them, that kind of value is important. But increasingly values, uh, i.e., the, the, the social values, the community values, that, and the uh, environmental values that a brand holds are very much a part of the package. Um, but I'd like to start by just thinking what, about what the world looked like, well, only three months ago. Um, and you know, before any of the, the, the COVID stuff hit, we knew and, uh, that you know, obviously trust was fundamental. Um, and you can see, you could see, and the, there are many surveys out there that, uh, that look at trust in society. And uh, you could see sort of what a foundation it is. I'll show you some of the results from those in a moment. Um, however, distrust is also fundamental in society. This is Friedrich Nietzsche and his, uh, his, uh, the great quotation from his, him is, I'm not upset that you lied to me. I'm upset that from now on, I can't believe you. And it gives that quote, I think, gives you a real sense of the, the ability of distrust to undermine a brand, right? So if you think about a brand, and if, it's, if it loses the faith or the confidence or the trust of consumers, then it's gonna be much harder for people to believe uh, what it says after that. Um, so uh, as if you, this is uh, from a survey called the Edelman Trust Index. And uh, it, it's, uh, let me just move this over here, okay. Um, and this is just one of many, many consistent results they've come up with over the years. So as, as of the 2020 Edelman Trust Barometer, which was actually done in late uh, 2019, the field work was, 66% um, of people across 28 markets agreed with the statement, I do not have confidence that our current leaders will be able to successfully address our country's challenges. 
Um, and you can see uh, from, the, from the bar chart there, the blue there is, uh, is, is positive and the red is negative and the, the, the sort of light blues is, is, um, uh, is neutral. And you can see on the right there, the red bars, the distrust bars are uh, mostly for religious leaders, government leaders, the very wealthy. Those are the people in society or the groups in society that are least trusted or most distrusted. On the other side, and this is interesting, the most trusted group in society uh, is scientists. Uh, people that followed by people in my local community, followed by citizens in my country. So, uh, as I say, that was the, uh, and this had been, uh, this process, I haven't shown you a time chart, but this process of loss of trust has been going on for many years. And you can see it year after year when you look at the survey that the, that trust goes a little bit down overall uh, each year. Um, so to look in, in a little more depth at that. This is from, again, from the Edelman Trust uh, Barometer. And you can see that uh, they, they, they look at it in a number of dimensions, but this one really interests me. Um, and you can look at it on a, on a scale from ethical to unethical and from less competent to more competent. And you can see that basically nobody's considered both ethical and competent. Uh, the government are considered unethical and less competent, media are in the same kind of category, NGOs, more ethical, less competent, business, more competent, less ethical. Um, so nobody's, nobody's really uh, striking it on both ethics and competence. So that's a little bit about some of the background. And the result of that has been that uh, we've, got, we've come up with really a, a trust crisis. So this was uh, a um, Sandra J. Sukar and Shailene Gupta in Harvard Business Review last uh, year contributed one of a series of articles called The Trust Crisis. And so they were arguing that, uh, you know, that many, uh, many companies such as Facebook and Boeing were actually lose, losing trust and uh, asking the question about, well, can they, can they gain it or can they regain it? Um, that said, I painted, painted a dark picture of trust. Um, and the question, however, is that some brands are still trusted. Okay? And our, our surveys, which I'll show you in a moment, shows that. So why is it that some brands are trusted and some are not? Um, well, like people, brands are considered to have personalities. There's our Pillsbury Doughboy, and our Pillsbury Doughboy is cheerful and chubby and uh, uh, you know, and, and brings joy to your home. Um, and uh, brands from, you know, from Apple to Nike um, to, to, to Pillsbury to even Charmin, all are considered by their, by their marketing teams or advertising agencies to have personalities. And they spend a lot of energy and time um, organizing and deciding what, are, what their brand personality is. What goes with that is that just like people, we have expectations and the expectations we would have, if you think about uh, what would make you trust somebody in your life or somebody you run into. Well, first of all, you would expect them to keep their promises. Um, secondly, you would expect them to treat you well. And thirdly, we would expect them to behave in a, in a reasonable fashion and you know, to treat society well, not, not throw their garbage on the street and so on. So those are three very basic qualities. Um, so keeping promises, treating us well, treating the, the, the rest of the community well. And so that, those are, if you like, the basis of our model of trust. So in the center of this diagram, you see, uh, you see brand trust. And that's a function of three types of trust. Um, value, is, I'll start with functional trust in the middle. Functional trust measures what, whether a brand does what it says it's going to do. Does it wash clothes whiter? Does it uh, you know, make your floors cleaner? Um, and also value for money. Does it, does it actually do what it's supposed to do? If it doesn't function or if it only functions sometimes, it's not gonna be very well trusted. Um, but down at the bottom there, you see relationship trust. And that's all about the way that a brand treats uh, customers. So in other words, the, does, does the brand take returns easily? Does it uh, have good customer service? Uh, is it possible to contact people and, and, and deal with issues and that sort of thing? That's kind of relationship trust, especially important for, for service brands, as you can imagine. And then at the top there is um, a, a one that I think we, we feel is a very strong contribution to the literature on trust, and that is values-based trust. And that the question there is, does the brand align with your values? Uh, or with, uh, sorry, does the brand with, align with the values of being a good citizen? Does it treat employees well? 
Does it treat communities well? Does it look after the planet? So those are the three groups of things. And there are questions then that feed into each one of those. And those in turn feed into brand trust. And we also ask whether it is trustworthy, whether it uh, um, acts with integrity. Ultimately, we also measure, you see over on the right, there are recommendations. That is whether um, uh, consumers will recommend this brand to others. And so we see now in our research, we've seen over the years, links between all of these factors. So these three types of trust yield an overall measure of brand trust, which in turn leads to recommendations to others. So you can say that if people trust your brand, they're going to recommend it to others. And then ultimately, that's going to mean uh, more profitability down the road. Now, as I, as I mentioned, we've been doing this uh, survey since uh, 2015. We're in our sixth year. Um, and this year, we've, we just went out in the, in the field with our 2020 survey, um, and that was in January, February, and almost 8,000 respondents, over 342 national brands. Those are both Canadian and global brands that are nationally distributed in Canada. We have some regional brands in there, but it's overwhelmingly about, uh, about nationally distributed brands. So as I mentioned, we've been doing this for... Um, uh, for six years, uh, and um, over the years, we have then announced this in May every year, and we you'll see some selections of the media coverage we've had. And so you can see down the bottom left here, uh, a one year that uh, President's Choice was uh, was named Canada's most trusted brand. Pure Later came very high. There's our Dean Saul Klein on TV. Uh, this is a uh, um, an announcement in uh, by Fairmont, which did very well and has consistently done well in our index. In fact, uh, this is NEC, Mount Equipment Co-op. They've also done very well. And of course, Huawei, great controversy about Huawei over the past couple of years and their, uh, uh, their um, rankings dropped quite dramatically in uh, 2019. So, so we've become, you know, very much our, our surveys, if you like, being awaited by the media each year, we go out and, and talk about it each time. So um, we have found over the years, the fundamental thing is that consumers reward the brands they trust and they recommend them to others. Moreover, we found a number of interesting things. Um, one is member ownership dominates. Uh, we've seen consistently each year that member owned organizations, and by, by those I mean, for instance, in um, the uh, Canadian Automobile Association, which is member owned, Mountain Equipment Co op, which is a member owned co op, Costco, which is also a co op, those, uh, those brands uh, seem to bubble to the top of the, the rankings every year. Um, we have a hypothesis about this, that uh, member ownership uh, signals authenticity to consumers. The fact that they own it means they have a stake in it. So there's a high level of trust that goes with that. We've also seen some uh, brands, and I can give you many examples, but the two that come immediately to mind are Samsung, which of course had exploding phones about, I guess it's three years ago now, and they find, have found it hard to regain trust. Samsung actually has slowly climbed back VW Volkswagen has had real trouble, um, and again, you know, if if you have, and the Volkswagen was over a, a scandal around emissions testing, and if you lose trust in, uh, it can take a lot of work and time to to regain it. Um, we have also found that expectations appear to differ by whether you're a product as opposed to a service. So if you're a product, you can see that. Uh, the idea that you're going to perform, that's the fun functional trust and the value for money, that's a fundamental thing for a product. Uh, relationship trust tends to bubble to the top more for, uh, for services. Um, brands do win trust by playing a positive role in society. That's values-based trust, but it does take time. This is not something that happens overnight. So people, as it's similar to the idea of regaining or lost trust. People are skeptical and it takes time to, to, to get them on board. Um, when there is a crisis, and we've seen many of them over the past six years, um, if, if a brand responds honestly, authentically, and quickly, um, and really show, is proactive about it, that tends to minimize damage to trust and help them to, to, uh, to come back relatively quickly. Women tend to be more trusting of brands than men are, which is an interesting finding we found that we've had over the years. That's fairly consistent. And interestingly, 
older Canadians trust brands more as well than, than do younger Canadians. Um, the, the keys to trust we found are, are consistent across brands. As I mentioned, it's hard to gain and easy to lose. Um, they, uh, an important key is to welcome feedback, provide remedies to consumers, treat employees and customers well. Um, all three types of trust, functional relationships and, and um, uh, values-based sustainability, all those matter. And then dealing with crisis authentically and honestly is an important part of this. So this was, um, so this next chart is the, uh, the ranking that we had in um, 2019. Uh, this is our top 10. Uh, at the top was Mountain Equipment Co-op. Um, at number two was the uh, Canadian Automobile Association. Number three was Costco. And they have pretty much traded places, those three brands, uh, for, uh, for the almost the history of the index. There have been one or two uh, shifts, uh, which we can talk about in a moment. Uh, others then, interestingly, Home Hardware then, and Home Depot uh, were well trusted. Um, in, in, um, or they came forth, uh, they tied for fourth. Fairmont Hotels and Resorts have always done well in the index. They dropped a bit last year, but they've always been in the top 10. Band-Aid, of course, is a, an iconic brand. Uh, Shoppers Drug Mart has, uh, was doing well, and that's up from, um, from their previous uh, um, 16th in, in 2018. Um, Interac, uh, Columbia Sports has uh, tended to be fairly high in the index, and Canadian Tire. Um, so as I mentioned there, the, the most trusted brands tend to stay trusted, and uh, yeah, there is a corollary, which is the ones at the bottom tend to stay at the bottom. Um, so that uh, uh, scraping the bottom of the index, uh, you'll be interested are brands like Facebook. Um, and uh, Google is not, uh, no, Google is better actually, but the social media brands, Facebook, Facebook, uh, Instagram and so on, tend to not do very well on, on, um, on brand trust. Um, so yeah, and then some of the, the things we saw then uh, last year, Facebook came in at the very bottom of our rankings. Social media brands um, accounted actually for four of the nine least trusted brands in Canada. Out of the, the 313 brands evaluated last year, five, including Facebook and Snapchat, got negative brand trust scores. And that is, uh, do you trust minus do you distrust? Uh, so definitely a, not a good picture from a social media point of view. More positive story then is Gillette. And you may remember that uh, Gillette ran a, uh, a controversial uh, ad in the Super Bowl last year um, addressing toxic mas masculinity. And it was a couple of weeks, that was, uh, as it happened, that was 2019. That was a couple of weeks before we fielded the, uh, the, the 2019 study. And it gave them um, quite a boost. So it, uh, it increased their values-based trust their, uh, score, especially around caring for the well-being of, of society. Um, another one was uh, Tesla. Tesla, uh, controversial these days uh, around COVID, but in 2016, it ranked uh, first among auto man manufacturers and 11th overall in brand trust. By 2017, though, their rank slipped to sixth among automakers and overall 14th. Um, ahead of uh, Elon Musk, some of the miscues he was making in, uh, in uh, 2018, 2019, the company had already dropped to 32nd in the, on the index in 2018. And this year, it, our, in 2019, uh, Tesla continued to downshift as the brand dropped uh, and, and once again slipped from, from its sixth place. So Tesla was not doing well uh, going, into the, going into the 2020 survey. And, and so it'll be interesting to see how that, uh, how that changes. Um, just in the past few days, you may have been uh, uh, noticing the, the news around um, Tesla in the US where they have insisted on uh, reopening their plant in Fremont in the face of uh, a, a ban by the, by the governor. So that again, we would expect in time, it won't it would be reflected in the current survey, but uh, in time we would expect that to erode their, their trust scores even further. Uh, another one that's really interesting is uh, Tim Hortons. 
Um, the, in 2018, if you think back, uh, there were scandals um, across Tim Hortons about franchisees cutting paid breaks. This is mostly in Ontario, cutting paid breaks, uh, benefits, and other incentives. As a result of, uh, in Ontario, there was a minimum wage uh, increase. So they, they had actually been doing very well up to that point. They, they were at number 27, and they absolutely collapsed down to 203rd in the rankings out of the uh, 300 national brands that were, that were surveyed that year, almost 300. Uh, given that the brand, it was actually, in our first survey, it was voted the most trusted brand in Canada. So it was a real dramatic call out. And yeah, we expected some, some effects when we did the survey, but this really surprised us too. Uh, this year, um, it climbed, or this year being 2019, last year, uh, it climbed 67 places to 136th, although we're still nowhere near where they were before. So it, it, it's a good case study of uh, how it's hard to regain trust once, you, once you've lost it and can take time. Um, overall, um, at, as a school, we believe that we're moving, and it's fairly well established that uh, the economy has moved from product-based to service-based, so that where function matters most to, to a service-based economy where relationships matter most, we believe that the economy is moving more to a values-based economy where uh, sustainability matters most. So in other words, uh, consumers are becoming more and more aware of a brand's efforts to look after communities and look after the planets, and those feed into the degree to which they trust brands. Um, the, so that's kind of, that was kind of the situation, I'll go back a moment, that was kind of the situation as we left 2019. And then, as I mentioned a little earlier, we did our, uh, our field work for the 2020 survey in January, February, and we were watching for a number of things. One of those was, uh, you know, specifically retailers. We saw that retailers were, were high in the rankings. Would they, would they dominate the ranks again? Would Gillette's, been, the, the Gillette's gain still last? Um, you know, there were some, there have been some um, disruptor brands and new brands in fast fashion, delivery services, retail, toys and games. We were interested in what impact they had. And the other question, of course, with you know, this disastrous performance that uh, social media brands have had, have they recovered uh, or has there been any, any glimmer of change? Remember that uh, some of the social media stuff in 2019 would have been a result of the Cambridge Analytica scandal. So uh, we were interested to see then by 2020 whether any of that had come back. So that was it. That was uh, as of January, February, we did our field work and then the world changed. And uh, I'm sure you'll recognize the, uh, the, 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 the image on the right, of course, coronavirus. And the question that we asked ourselves once we had time to lock ourselves in our homes and draw a breath was, well, you know, I wonder what impact this, uh, this dramatic change might have had on trust. So uh, there have been some early results on trust overall, and I'll talk about those, and then I'll talk about what we ended up uh, doing about some of this. Um, one is that the, the Pew Research Center um, did, uh, did some research in, in between March 19th and 24th. And indeed, um, in the US at that time, there was broad support for the uh, kinds of uh, initiatives that local government and state government were, were, were taking. You can see that here that, that the vast majority of people, these are the big bars here, thought that people in their household, the school system, local government, state government were all doing the right thing. There were minorities on, on either side, but pretty much the vast majority were thinking that, that things were going, were going right. You'll notice that federal government is not there. Um, so the, um, these, uh, the, the Pew report suggested that the results you're seeing on the screen there really cut across party lines. So whether you're Republican or Democrat, it didn't matter. If you were, on the other hand, a Republican, you were more likely to say that businesses uh, shouldn't have been shut down uh, to the extent that they were, and you were more likely to support uh, the president as, uh, and the federal government. 
then were, and that was a very polarized situation. But as far as local government was concerned, the school system, etc., there was there has been, and I would argue, likely still is a broad level of consensus that uh, that the, that um, things are going okay. So there's a, a a good level of public trust around some of that, which is a change, right? So uh, you remember a moment ago, going into uh, 2020, we saw that uh, trust in institutions was eroding. And so there's some evidence here now that huh, maybe in this crisis, we're now seeing that uh, trust made in institutions may be reestablished. And how, whether that is the case, and how, if so, how long it will last, we don't know. So this is still something that we're going to be looking at. From our point of view within the Gustafson School, we, we were very interested in this and thinking, well, how are, how are brands responding to this crisis? And is brand trust shifting? In other words, as brands respond to it, and, and you saw lots and lots of responses, I'll talk about a few examples in a moment. Um, the question is, was that having an impact on brand trust scores? So we pivoted and we went out a second time in April with uh, some field work, did a slightly uh, written a, a smaller scale survey uh, with this time with uh, over a thousand respondents, we restricted the number of brands and we did it in April so we could do it quickly and get the results for comparison with the results we'd had in, in January and February. So those results, along with the, the January, February results, we're actually currently compiling and we're going to be uh, releasing those in June. But let me give you a few of the stories that we were, that we were observing and watching. Uh, one was in um, the one that hit the news uh, was that uh, Dyson, the company that makes uh, your your vacuum cleaners, was actually asked by the the UK government to design ventilators, um, which they did using some of their existing motor technology, and they invested twenty million pounds UK pounds in it, and designed an amazing effort, designed ventilators in ten days. Uh, to fill what uh, the government had told them would be a, a shortage. Uh, sadly, um, once they'd done that, the government pulled the rug out and, and said, whoops, sorry, we don't actually need the ventilators now. We, we think there is not so much of a shortage of, of ventilators at this, at this time. So uh, James Dyson himself said that he would personally underwrite the 20 million uh, pounds that they spent on this. And there's some prospect that they will be able to recover some of that in, in other markets. But certainly they responded quickly and in a very credible and authentic fashion. Um, another one uh, was, was Ford. Uh, so Ford, uh, first of all, uh, were very, very, um, made it very clear that the health, health and safety of their customers and employees was a top priority. And they um, encouraged um, uh, existing customers to discuss payment extensions of up to 90 days. Um, and some eligible new purchases in 29, of 2019, 2020 models um, would get up to six months of payment relief and three months of deferred payments and so on. So the point here was that they, uh, what Ford was doing is just trying to ease some of the financial um, uh, demands that they make on, on customers to repay car loans and that, and that kind of thing. Uh, again, in order to help people through the crisis and ultimately, I argued, to build trust in, in the brand. And another one here is uh, Tim Boyle, who is the CEO of Columbia Sportswear, uh, took a uh, salary cut, that was a kind of a, a large salary cut because his salary was 3.3 million in 2018, and he limited his salary to $10,000 a year. Other company executives, executives have taken a 15% cut in pay. Uh, however, they will continue to pay employees, even those who, who work at the retail stores, which have been closed during the outbreak. So those are three uh, stories of things that companies have done to, uh, to try and retain uh, trust and maybe regain it. And there are many, many more uh, that, you can, that, that we could be talking about. Um, so at this point, uh, the, we are, as I said, analyzing, compiling the results. We will be releasing them on uh, June 15th. So make sure that you, uh, that you know that or that you have that in your calendar. And as I mentioned, we will have both sets of results. We'll have the 2020 results, the January, February fieldwork, and what we call the 2020.1, which is the April fieldwork. So we'll be able to see uh, what effect COVID-19 has had on, on 
trusts our trust for different brands and their rankings uh, in in trust and so on. I will give you a hint that we are seeing some significant shifts, and it's a little too early to talk in detail about what they are. But I think it's it, you'll find it a very interesting picture. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, the research uh, that we've been doing over the past five years, is six years, I should say, uh, has has uh, you know, very important lessons. They're, they're important for both business and society. Trust is important to, to business, to brands. It's the basis of social behavior. Good behavior is awarded, bad behavior punished. Trust is hard to gain, easy to lose. And of course, the value for money is important, but values are increasingly so. I want to leave you with one, um, I hope, uh, one question that I hope will uh, provoke some thought, especially if you're a brand owner. Um, I think we need to be thinking less about how trusted are we and more about how trustworthy are we as brands. And let, let, let me just try and draw the distinction for you. Uh, when we say trusted, that, when we, if a brand is trusted, that's very much about its actions and particularly its visible actions, right? And we've talked about what those are. Functional trust, relationship trust, values trust. So it's how do you perform? How do you treat customers? How do you treat employees? How do you treat customers? All of those are the activities that 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 you conduct. However, um, that starts to sound a bit like a mix of a box checking and a communication exercise. And I'd I'd like us to be thinking not so much about checking the boxes on function values and relationship, but how trustworthy are we? Are we? And that I, by that I mean, this is all about identity. Right? So when we think about identity, how authentic are we as a company? What kind of priority do we give to certain things within the company? We have to make trade-offs. How do we make those trade-offs? What actions do we make that are not actually visible to, to customers? In other words, things like who you hire and why you hire them, how you run meetings, who sits in what place at meetings, what hidden cultural messages are there within, within your company. If you can look at those things, the trustworthiness, the, the sort of identity measures, the trust, I believe, will, will follow. Um, so, so I think that's where we need to be focusing our energies and focusing our, um, our intentions. So that's where I, I will leave it for today. Um, we have a bit of time for questions. I'm going to put up some contact information on the screen here, and then I'm happy to, uh, to take some questions. So Shannon, I'm ready anytime. David, you can open up the Q&A tool at the bottom and read off the first one. Uh, let's see, where are we? Uh, yes, uh, this is Colleen. Uh, Colleen is saying, I'm an MBA student at McGill. Welcome, Colleen. Uh, when brands lose trust, how does the type of trust lost affect how much, how much is lost and how long it takes to regain that trust? For example, does losing values-based trust hurt brands more than losing functionally based trust. I'm thinking of the Samsung versus VW example. That's a really interesting one, uh, actually. Yeah. Um, uh, let me see. I, I don't, you, you know, I don't have a, an, an empirical or a research based answer for that. I can give you a bit of speculation. And I think where you're, what you're hinting at is, is probably true that if you've got a, uh, a brand that loses trust for, you know, for some functional reason, the phones explode or whatever, and then you come back with a new generation of phone and you uh, have advertising that, uh, that reassures people that the, uh, that the performance of the phone is different, that everything, that everything has changed, then that seems to be an easier uh, communication issue to, to deal with than say, uh, uh, you know, an oil spill or, uh, you know, or corruption as in the case of VW. So, because that seems to be a much more fundamental issue with the company itself that's hard and it, I would say that customers would be far more skeptical about a situation like that. I don't have data to prove it, but it's a very reasonable hypothesis. Uh, Diana, um, Diana, is it recommendable to change a brand? I'm running a digital law firm, but I'm not sure about the brand. It is my partner's brand. Um, the general uh, advice on changing brands is don't or do so with a great degree of caution. Um, and the reason is that um, 
consumers are, as uh, the research of people are cognitive minimizers. In other words, they are um, not going to do an awful lot of work to try and figure out what your brand is. Uh, so if you change, the risk is that you're going to confuse people. And if they confuse people, they're not going to usually take the time to figure out what's the change unless they're really, really invested and involved in it. There are exceptions to that. Uh, one classic exception is Marlboro Cigarettes, which in the 1950s was actually a women's cigarette brand and then switched over to being the, the cowboy brand and uh, you know, very, very macho and very male. So there are exceptions to it. And obviously Marlboro didn't suffer as a result of it, suffered as a result of, as a result of killing people, I suppose, but not as a result of that. Uh, but generally speaking, if you have a decent loyal following, you're better to build on that than to change radically and, uh, and shift over to a, to a very different message. Okay. Uh, uh, Savane. Uh, Savane, um, what's the best way to take strict economical measures, salary adjustment in times of COVID, without losing trust of employees and customers? Um, I would say that's such a tough decision, first of all. It's, uh, and uh, it's one that I'm sure a lot of people are asking. Uh, my answer to that is transparency. Right. So it is really trying to be honest and uh, frank and open with your with your employees and your customers to to really uh, let them know that uh, you have their best interests at heart, that you are working on their behalf and there are just some constraints on, on uh, what you're able to do. To some extent, the government is, is filling some of the gap. So the question then is, to, uh, to, to really be authentic and real about it and try not to hide things from them. Transparency goes a long way. So that looks like it for now. You're welcome, Sanjay. Sabine, I should say. Looks like that is it for the time being. Um, are there any more? If there are no more, I think we can can wrap up there. Um, so I'll uh, I'll say thank you very much to everybody who attended, and uh, I hope that you found it useful. The contact information is there. By the way, if you uh, uh, contact Gustus and Trust at uvic.ca, the email there, you will get the wonderful Venus, and uh, she she is. Uh, capable of answering um, pretty much any question. If there's anything she has any questions about, she will put you through to either uh, myself or to um, or to Saul or to Linda. So uh, have a great day. Enjoy the weekend, and I, I wish you all well. Thank you. <laughs>